Spirit, amen. <clears throat> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death, amen. Your Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. So, um, today's, <laughs> today's topic is on humility. And I thought long and hard before I signed this topic. And uh, since humility is my greatest virtue, I thought I would, I would uh, be doing it. But actually, the, uh, this was originally was uh, scheduled for Father Mo, but he's on vacation. And I'm a little disappointed that he can't buy locate, but he said he can't. So uh, I got stuck doing it. And I mean stuck because me and humility, really. Uh, this, is, this is a little humbling being here this morning. So, but um, the uh, the topic is really patience and humility. But I think Hugo has has covered the uh, topic of patience and his struggles with it quite quite adequately over the years. So, we're going to kind of go through that and get right on to the humi humility part. Um, first, there's outward humility that which we see. So the value of humility in general is to receive God's grace into our hearts. They must be emptied, our hearts must be emptied of our own vainglory. Okay. To receive God's grace, we, we have to be humble to receive God's grace, so when we receive it, you recognize it. By being humble, humility drives away Satan and keeps the graces and gifts of the Holy Spirit safe within us. So the purpose of, of humility really is to empty yourself. It, it's not to walk around with your head down and, and, and looking all disheveled or whatever. Humility is really to empty yourself so that you can be filled with God's grace. The value of outward humility is it helps to avoid vainglory to whatever we assign to ourselves. Something that is not, not actually in us, like possessions, ancestry, those are things we have nothing to do with. They just come with us. Something that is in us but not of us, like good looks, for instance, and something that is in us and of us, clever learning. So all these things can... can detract us from humility by thinking that we have something special, you know, whether it's good looks or inheritance or ancestry or even being particularly clever or smart. Um, those are things that can lead us away from humility by thinking, well, we're special because of these things. And we're not. Well, you're not, some of us being clever. Tests of outward humility. You observe whether a person's abilities tend to humility, modesty, and obedience, for in that case, they will be truly good. Right? One of the things that struck me, uh, anybody, of, any of you watch the NFL Honors this week, the Saturday night before the Super Bowl? There we go, real football fans here. Well, one of the things that so many of the... Uh, uh, recipients did is they, they literally, they got up and one of the first things they did, and I don't know if it was true, truly in humility or what, but they did say it. They all, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, thank God, recognizing that they wouldn't be where they are without the talents that God gave them, the abilities that God gave them. And that kind of struck me, that outward humility 
they, they, they tended to realize that their gifts and their abilities weren't of their own doing. So, do the abilities tend to, tend to humility, modesty, and obedience? I think in a lot of those cases it did, and it struck me. The real test is whether all the wonderful things in a person lead him or her closer to God. Right? In other words, do you use the abilities you're given to grow closer to God, or do you use them in a worldly way? You know, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. You can do things of this world and in this world and still draw closer to God, but when you're doing things because of the world, you're really drawing away from God. And humility would present that. If you're truly humility, would prevent that. Humility is, re- is recognizing the truth about ourselves. Our gifts are from God. A right attitude toward honors. Those who aspire to virtue do not trouble themselves over honors. The other thing that I like the most about the NFL honors is the one award that everybody which is kind of the opposite of humility, but really coveted or wanted, was the Walton, Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. And that award is given not for anything you do on the field. Each team gets to uh, nominate uh, a recipient uh, or no- nominate a, uh, not a contestant, but a recipient, I guess. Anyway. They, uh, they nominate somebody, and then one person is picked. And it's for the work they do off the field, the charitable work they do off the field. And every year, it's, they, they, they tend to pick somebody who really gets involved in the community that goes above and beyond themselves and uses their fame and fortune, if you will, to help their own communities. And uh, it's pretty, it, it was pretty cool that that's the one award that everybody really strives for and would like to get. And it's the one that has nothing to do with their God-given talents, but using their God-given talents to get where they are to use that to help others. So I would call that a right attitude towards honors. There are exceptions. Everyone can take and keep his or her proper rank without damage to humility if this is done unaffectedly and without quarreling. Right. There, are, there are people, our bosses, or if we're, or if we're, you know, we have management responsibility over others. You know, you can keep your rank. You can recognize as somebody else's rank. But again, you want to do it in honesty and humility. You don't want to bicker about it. You don't want to, and you don't want to seem overly affected by it, especially if you're the one that has uh, people that work for you or, or. Uh, in this case, like in my case, the minions in front of me, you don't want to, you know, you, you don't, uh, you don't want to laud it over people. Um, and, that, and then St. Francis says, I do not refer to those whose dignity concerns the public or to certain particular occasions attended, attended with great consequence. Okay? There are those who President of the United States, whoever that might be, has certain privileges, if you will, that come with the office. Uh, even the Pope, right? I mean, even the Pope gets driven around, has a lot of attendants and servants and things of that nature. But you, how you approach that is what matters. Um, as St. Francis says, in these matters, everyone ought to keep what belongs to him or her with prudence and discretion. Okay. Outward humility. Okay. Interior humility. Interior humility does not demand blindness to our blessings. The true means to attain love of God is the consideration of his benefits. The more we know about them, the more we shall love God. So if you have a, if you have a particular talent or, or benefit or ability, you shouldn't, humility does not demand that you hide it or you ignore it or, or anything of that nature. It demands that you use it to its fullest but recognize where it comes from. It comes from God. 
And that's why, again, going back to all these athletes accepting these awards, they were thanking God for their abilities and their talents. Nothing, to quote St. Francis, nothing can so effectively humble us before God's mercy as the multitude of his benefits. Again, it's the recognition that what we have and where it comes from and what we should do with it. Nothing can so deeply humble us before his justice as our countless offenses against them. Again, reiterating, St. Saint, Saint Francis, if you, if you read, how many of you actually read the same number of football fans we have, huh? Yeah. Um, I found, I found that, that in this particular section that he was repeating himself using different words, but repeating the same things frequently, kind of driving into us. Um, so that he says again, if we reflect on what we did when God was not with us, we will easily perceive that what we do when he is with us is not the result of our own efforts. Again, it's, it's that theme, it's that recognition in consciousness that everything we have comes from God. Whether it be possessions, talents, abilities, whatever, it all comes from God. One of the things, and I'm not bragging here because I think probably most people here would do it. At my office when the, uh, the uh, Powerball was like $394 million, uh, somebody says, you know, if you win, what would you do? I said, well, we'd give half to charity. Why would you do that? It's your money. I said, well, even if you take it yearly, Three hundred ninety-four million is something over thirteen million dollars a year. You give half to charity, and I think with a little economizing, I could live on six and a half million dollars a year. I mean, you know, you have to cut back on certain things, but I could. But then I also said, it's not my money. You know, I give two dollars for a ticket. I always only buy one ticket because if God wants me to win, I don't need twenty of them. Just one ticket, and if I don't win, it goes towards education. I don't see a real lost there either way but if I do win and I think and again I'm not bragging because I'm sure most people here would give a substantial amount away and in fact I think if we won 13 million knowing my wife we'd give more than half away so which is not a bad thing but again the recognition that even something like hitting the lottery comes with a responsibility you know God gave it to you do the right thing with it by the way, I'm not sharing anything with you guys, just in case you were wondering. Uh, where are we? Interior humility. Advice on appearing humble. True humility does not make a show of it and hardly speaks in a humble way. That kind of fits me. True does not make a show and hardly speaks in a humble way. There I am. Um... Yeah, if you're truly hu uh, humble, you don't you don't make a big deal of it. I mean that that you know, false piety. We all recognize that. You know, you recognize the person who who uh, this. I know somebody in particular who brags how they're a Christian and they they go to they're Protestant, so they go to services every week, and then they have. Uh, Bible study on Wednesdays and blah, blah, blah. And next thing you know, she said, will you stop that? Do you know how much it irritates me? And I'm thinking, oh, there's a Christian attitude for you. So, you know, I, I think the same thing with humility. If you're acting humble and you're acting, it's a false humility. And it's not something that, that uh, really God thinks is great. Let us not lower our eyes except when we humble our hearts. Let us not make a show of wanting to be the lowest unless we desire to be such with all our heart. You know, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. You, know, you sit in the back of the room fully expecting to be called forward because, you know, you're more important than that. And then at the end of the event, you're still sitting in the back of the room and you get all ticked off. Yeah. 
It's never happened to me more than a few times. Uh, unless we desire it. God, good manners require that we show precedence which may be refused. To say certain words of respect which may not be strictly true may be appropriate under certain circumstances. Right? Uh, the, our past two presidents are excellent examples of that. Of Obama, if you were a conservative or a Republican, I, boy, I heard some nasty things about Obama. And it was all about politics, but he's still the president of the United States and deserved a certain respect that, you know, maybe you may not truly feel about that, but nonetheless, president of the United States. It's the same thing with our current president. If you're a Democrat or a liberal or something, let's impeach him. I mean, you know, let, let's get rid of him. But even so, it's a political process, but even so, he is the current president of the United States and deserves a certain amount of respect for the office so that we may show him a deference to say certain things that aren't strictly in our hearts, but nevertheless, the office demands it. You don't have to go overboard, but, you know, show the proper respect. That's actually humbling yourself to do the right thing. Our words should always be suited as closely as possible to what we feel so that in all things we may maintain heartfelt sincerity and candor. Always be suited as closely as possible to what we feel. Doesn't mean go out of your way to tell somebody you don't like them. But don't go out of your way to say how great they are if you don't like them either. Just kind of be neutral on it. Humility in relation to striving for perfection. When God desires to give us his grace, it is pride to refuse them. Apologize for that. I thought this was off. Um, so strive, when God desires to give us his graces, it is pride to refuse them. Sometimes we feel I'm not worthy, right? Oh, I, I, I shouldn't accept that. I'm not worthy. Well, if God is giving you something, you should accept it and then use it to the, to, to the glory of God, whatever it is, whatever circumstance you find yourself in. If it's a good circumstance and he's gracing you with something, accept it and then use it to his glory. God's gifts obligate us to accept them, and it is humility to obey and comply as nearly as we can. Generosity to lower ourselves in God's eyes involves a trust in God's unconditional love and mercy. Charity. Char this virtue is the true sum of all virtues and should have dominion over them. Acts of humility that are offensive to charity are certainly false. Right. Public opinion. If people think foolish of you because of your true devotion, humility will cause you to rejoice at such fortunate criticism, for its cause is not in you, but in those who make it. Right? One of the I think best compliments I ever got was years and years ago, I had a boss, about 10 years ago, I had a boss who I think she was a little psychotic actually. I mean, she was, she was all over the place. She was very hot tempered and everything. But anyways, so it was when I first, uh, my first real job actually, I'd always been self-employed. So my first real job, I'm doing my job and I don't go around looking to proselytize anybody at work, but bring up religion or God, and there I am. Well, I was about two or three years into my stint at the state, and my boss comes up to me on a Wednesday and says, Wow, I would have thought I would have seen you with ashes on your forehead today. Which, on the one hand, I think she was trying to give me a little dig, but on the other hand, she recognized, here's a Catholic. Here's a Catholic. And so in all humility, I said, you're so stupid. That doesn't come till noon. I mean, you know. 
You've got to go to church to get those. You don't throw them on yourself. So, but in all humility, I did that in all humility. But again, I think it was one of those things where um, that was a little humbling to, re- you know, to, to have somebody recognize you, not just as a Christian, but as a Catholic, because let's face it, ashes are a Catholic thing. But I took it actually as a, as a compliment. Um, love your objections, abjections. In all things and through all things, you should love your own objections, quote for St. Francis. Objection is lowliness, meanness, and baseness in us, even if we are not aware of that fact. What are, what are our shortcomings? All right. You should love them, not so that you can continue them, but so you can address them and avoid them. Humility is true knowledge and acknowledgement of our objections. True humility consists in willingly admitting our objection, but not loving and delighting in it. Recognize it so that you can address it. There are certain virtues that are abject and virtues that are honorable. Worldly people consider patience, meekness, simplicity, and humility abject in the world. Right? They look at you as weak. Patience, I've never been accused of that, so I wouldn't know. Worldly people hold prudence, courage, and liberality in high esteem. Giving alms and forgiving injuries are both charitable acts. Everyone holds giving alms in honor. Worldly people despise forgiving injuries, right? What are you supposed to do? Get even. Otherwise, you're weak. True humility would tell us to forgive. Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Correcting objections. Although we love the objection that follows an evil, we must not forget to correct by just and lawful means the evil that caused it. Love the objection that follows evil, but not forget to correct by just and lawful means the evil that it caused. Again, going back to recognize them, embrace them, but do so to get rid of them. You have to recognize your objections, your flaws, right? Recognize them and correct them. It's some, and these are quotes from St. Francis. It sometimes happens that charity requires us to remove the objection for the good of a neighbor before whom our good name must be preserved. The best kinds of objections are those which come to us accidentally or because of our state in life. Words, what best kind of objection are those which come to us accidentally. So if we do something accidentally, I mean if we if we are if we're um, like meanness is not something that comes to us accidentally. Anybody know a mean person? Stop pointing, but other than that. Anybody know a mean person? That's different than if you do something that negatively affects your neighbor, there should be an objection that comes with that for you personally. And you need to recognize that. And the reason it's the best kind is it came accidentally. It's not part of your nature. So recognize it and fix it. Now, part of of being humble is that... uh, uh, people could re- really trample your good name. They, you know, they call you a milk toast, or they could even they could even um, accuse you of some really awful thing. Uh, you need to preserve your good name if it's untrue. If the accusation is untrue, you can't just let people trample over, all over you. But humility prevents us from seeking after praise, honor, and glory. However. Charity requires and humility agrees that we should desire to have a good name and carefully preserve it. 
It's your reputation, right? We're really talking about re your reputation. What is your reputation? You know, if it's a good reputation and it's earned, that's a good thing. If it's a bad reputation and it's unearned, you need to correct it, but you need to do it in the right way. A good name, why should we preserve our name or our reputation, really? It is one of the bases of human society, right? If you have a good reputation, people will come to you, they'll seek out your advice, maybe your help, something of that nature. The duty of preserving our reputation is the urgings of a generous spirit to go forward with a strong and agreeable impulse, right? Do the right thing. What do we say about being Catholic, about doing the right thing, though? Being Catholic is if you do the right thing when nobody's looking. It should always do the right thing. It should be a strong and agreeable impulse. Although love of God is the principal pres preservative of our virtues, we can also employ our good name as very proper and useful for that purpose. Right. Again, your reputation precedes you. Is it a good one? Is it earned? I mean, do you just have this reputation because you have a good press agent, or is it well-deserved? I mean, we talk about Kobe Bryant. I know it seems ad nauseum at this point. One of the things he, does, he did with his 13-year-old daughter that day, I think it was that day or the day before, is before they were off to, I, I think it might have been the day before. I, I forget the exact details of the story. Was it that day? He had taken his 13-year-old daughter to services, got up early before wherever they were going in the helicopter, and he took her to services. Right? Now, there's a guy who, you know, as far as we're concerned, had everything. But I think, I don't know him, but it seems to me he had his priorities straight. God first, everything else second. Those who try too carefully to maintain their rep reputation lose it entirely. Right? Are you always challenging every little thing that's said about you? The little ones that don't matter, do you let them go? Or, do, or do, you really, do you really try to build your reputation through words as opposed to actions? Contempt for injuries causes them to vanish. Just ignore them. We must prefer the fruit before the leaves. That is, the interior spiritual graces above all external goods. If another harms your reputation, do not be disturbed. It will return, your reputation that is, not only as beautiful as before, but much stronger. Again, you can't let really onerous, unjust accusations go unchallenged. But you don't need to challenge every little thing that's said about you. If you have a good, strong reputation and it's earned, you know, the little gossip and the things that people say about you behind your back or whatever, they'll go away. They'll go away. The root of a good name is virtue and probity, honesty and integrity. It's at the root. What do you actually do? If we are condemned unjustly, let us oppose truth to calum Kevin, C A L U M N Y, calumny, calumny. Yeah, thank, thank you. See what I just did right there? I was humble. What? Oh, oh. I suppose you're going to say pointing it out is just the. Oh, okay, fine, fine. Be that way. If, if the calumny continues, let us continue to humble ourselves. There we go, I'm back there. By surrendering our reputation together with our soul into God's hands, we safeguard it in the best possible way. I think that's another way of just saying that no matter what your reputation is on earth, if in fact you have lived a faithful life to God, that's what really matters. In the end, what judgment are we really concerned with as Catholics, as, as Christians, as human beings? Final judgment. That that we're judged by on earth 
It's passing. It's transient. So remember, by surrendering our reputation together with our soul into God's hands, we safeguard it in the best possible way. On your stand, we